All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming out to our meeting today. Um, I, we we want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Robin Metcalf, who is a professor at the Division of Natural Science at, Sciences at York University, where she has been teaching physics and astronomy for over 20 years. Robin's PhD research pertained to extragalactic astronomy, but her current interests are in the search for life beyond Earth and the implications of such a discovery on humanity. Through her teachings, Robin shares uh, her passion for the night sky and the outdoors. She teaches students to appreciate what the night sky has to teach us, to gain perspective from our place in the universe, and to value our precious planet Earth. Um, I just wanted to mention that the talk will go first. We'll have our break where we'll get our solar viewers and do our raffle. And then what we're going to do is come back for the Q&A uh, and closing announcements. Uh, with that, I welcome Dr. Metcalf. Okay, thank you. Thank you all so much for braving the snow and making it out here. Um, before I begin my actual talk, I just wanted to share a bit of background about how this talk actually came to be. So last uh, October, um, I, you know what, I can't see anything at all over here. Is there like a, a stage light or something? If not, I'll be fine. Okay, don't worry, we're good. Um, so last, last October, I spent a week at Killarney Provincial Park as the astronomer in residence. And um, one of the requirements of the resident is that they give a public talk to visitors in the park on some astronomy topic that's suitable for a general audience. The talk is given at night in their outdoor amphitheater. And you can see a photo of it here. It's really dreamy in, uh, in early October. I took this photograph the day before my talk was scheduled. So since I was gonna give the talk at night outdoors, under the dark Killarney skies where the northern lights can apparently be uh, be seen once in a while. The, the plan was I was going to give give a talk at night outdoors under the, the beautiful uh, Killarney skies where I had been told that the northern lights could sometimes be seen. And so I thought, how perfect would it be to give a talk about the northern lights under the northern lights? Now, unfortunately, the one drawback of giving a talk in a beautiful outdoor amphitheater is that it is highly weather dependent. And on the night that my event was scheduled, the temperature dropped down to the single digits and it poured rain. So the event was canceled and the talk was never given. But what I had planned was a very general talk about how aurora are produced. And I included some slides on notable aurora throughout history. Um, now in the process of developing those slides, uh, I came across a recent discovery what, of what is possibly the oldest record of an aurora from about 3,000 years ago. And in this record, putting together the slides of notable aurora throughout history, I came across this, this recent discovery, might be the oldest record of, of an aurora from about 3,000 years ago. And in this record, there's this event and it's described as a five colored light in the Northern sky. So at first I was just going to mention this as, a, as an interesting historical event, but then I thought, just in case there's a RASC member in the audience, then I'm probably gonna get the question, how do we know that this five colored light was actually an aurora? So I figured I should say a little something about the evidence to support this claim, but then that little something ended up taking the talk into all sorts of awesomely nerdy rabbit holes and it caused the talk to just explode in length. And a friend of mine who had given talks at Killarney before politely told me that if my talk goes one second over 45 minutes, then the kids are gonna start to cry. <laughs> so I ended up cutting out a lot of the good stuff and I reduced the talk to just behind the scenes of an Aurora. That was the original boring title. But um, then when I was asked to give the talk to this crowd, I thought not only do I have a whole extra 15 minutes uh, and presumably without the risk of us getting rained on, I also figured that this group would love to hear all that super cool nerdy stuff. Or at least you're not gonna run away crying, hopefully just out of, you know, manners. <laughs> so um, what you're going to hear tonight, you lucky, lucky people, is uh, the director's cut with never before seen footage. 
Okay, so here we go. This is the actual talk. It is exactly 57 minutes. Um, okay, welcome to the Killarney Provincial Park Amphitheater. It's been an amazing week exploring this gorgeous area, and I am so grateful for this opportunity to be able to share my love of the night sky with a group of like-minded people in such a unique and awesome setting. So I'll start by uh, briefly introducing myself. My name is Robin Metcalf. I'm an astronomy professor at York. I've been there for over 20 years. Uh, my research background is in the area of extragalactic astronomy. That just means I study other galaxies beyond our own galaxy, what we call the Milky Way. Uh, but for the last several years, I have been focused entirely on teaching, in particular, teaching university students who have no background in astronomy. Uh, I find that to be the most enjoyable and meaningful teaching that I can do because it gives me the opportunity to ignite an appreciation for not just the night sky, but also the outdoors and how important it is for us to preserve this amazing and precious planet that we all share. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is the awesome phenomenon known as the Aurora, what we call the Northern Lights here in Canada. And I chose this topic because I've never seen an aurora. It's a top bucket list of mine. And I've been told that the Northern Lights can sometimes be seen from Killarney Park. And incidentally, that's where this photograph of the Northern Lights was taken. Uh, I was going to get a show of hands of how many of you have seen the aurora, but I can't see you at all. So if maybe you have better eyesight. I see a few hands. Okay. What, what do we think, like 50% of us? Really? Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, you're all very, very lucky. So if you've seen an aurora, you were probably at a higher latitude than we're at now, maybe places like northern Canada, Alaska, Iceland, or uh, the far southern latitudes, the tip of South America, maybe even Antarctica. And we're going to talk about why that is, because we're going to get pretty deep into the science of an aurora, what exactly causes them. But before we get into that, though, we're first going to look at just uh, a few of the ways that aurora have been interpreted by different cultures and how that has led to the diversity of names that aurora go by. So the widely adopted scientific term for the northern lights is the aurora borealis. That term came from the Italian astronomer and physicist Galileo. Galileo would have been able to see them once in a while from his hometown in northern Italy. It was just a couple of degrees north of where we are now. And Galileo described the northern lights by following the tradition of naming celestial phenomena after gods and goddesses in Greek and Roman mythology. So he chose the name Aurora Borealis, Aurora because that's the Roman goddess of the dawn, the bringer of light, and Borealis after Boreas, the Roman god of the northern wind to reflect the, the movement of the lights it's as though the glow is being blown by the wind, as you can see in the real-time video. This is a photograph of an aurora seen from Churchill, Manitoba. Churchill is at a latitude of 58 degrees north of the equator, so it's nearly two-thirds of the way to the North Pole. And at those higher latitudes, aurora are seen more frequently, and they tend to have a more vibrant appearance. In, the, in this photograph, in addition to the green glow, you can see some purples and some pinks, and the light appears more defined. We can see what looks like lines and swirls as opposed to just a blurry glow. To uh, the OG Cree, who are one of the first nations in this part of Northern Canada, the Aurora are called Wawate, and they were believed to represent the spirits of the ancestors. That could be interpreted as either a good thing or a bad thing, just depending on what the observer was experiencing at the time. So sometimes the lights were seen as issuing a, um, as the spirits issuing a warning or an omen of some kind, or sometimes the lights meant that the spirits are dancing with happiness or laughter. This photograph was taken from Stewart Island, which is the southernmost region of New Zealand, latitude of 47 degrees south. We can also see the uh, our two nearest galaxies right there, the large Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud. And in this southern part of the world, the aurora are known as the aurora australis, which comes from the Latin for southern dawn. But to the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori, 
the aurora were given a name which translates to burn in the sky, and that refers to the reflections of the campfires that were built by the ancestors. So again, we see a connection drawn with the spiritual realm, and that theme is found in the names given by many other cultures as well, reflecting the sort of ghostly appearance of this uh, phenomenon. Now, of course, aurora have been lighting up the skies for far longer than humans have been around to witness them and describe what they saw. But the first suspected written account of an aurora goes quite far back to nearly 3,000 years ago in ancient China. And the uh, discovery was made from a translation of an ancient text that you see on the right. The text was found on bamboo slabs known as the bamboo annals, which is on the left. And what the translation says is in the last year of King Zhao during the night, a five colored light penetrated Ziwei, which refers to the northern side of the sky. In that year, the king inspected the southern regions and did not return. Now, you might be thinking a five colored light that could mean all sorts of things. So why is this suspected to be an aurora? Like the description, it doesn't even give us a sense of how large this light was in the sky, right? Maybe it was a comet. Maybe it was a supernova. Well, here's where the discovery gets kind of cool and mysterious. According to historians, the ancient Chinese astronomers were tasked by the various ruling dynasties with recording anomalous events in the sky. So things like comets and eclipses, because in the 10th century BC in this part of the world, it wasn't yet understood that those events follow a regular cycle. So instead, these sightings were believed to be unpredictable events that reflected chaos on Earth. For example, something as chaotic as the disappearance of a king. So it's clear that this text is referring to something seen as highly unusual in the sky. And that's consistent with the appearance of an aurora from the latitude of this sighting, because the latitude of the sighting is only about 34 degrees north and aurora are hardly ever seen at latitudes so close to the equator. The uh, aurora that you see on the slide was actually taken from the northernmost region of China, which is at a latitude of 52 degrees north. But the rare aurora at lower latitudes does actually occur uh, occasionally. And when they occur, they leave behind little clues for us to find in some really interesting places. And later on, I'm gonna show you the evidence to support that claim. For now, I'm going to leave this mystery hanging for just a bit, and I'm going to take you instead to the story of how humans discovered the cause of Aurora. And uh, it's a really neat story because it involves some interesting problem solving. It's uh, kind of like realizing that a bunch of puzzle pieces that have no obvious connection, that they they fit together and they reveal a picture of what's what is actually going on behind the scenes when we see an Aurora. Okay, so I'm going to start um, not at the actual beginning, but close to the beginning. We're going to first look at a little piece of the puzzle that came from radio astronomy, just because it's a neat little warm-up story to the heavier stuff that's coming up. Okay, so radio astronomy simply refers to observing the sky by looking at the really long wavelength lights, the light waves you see on, on the left that celestial bodies produce as opposed to the relatively short wavelength light that the human eye can actually see, the visible wavelengths. So radio waves are typically a billion times longer in wavelength than um, uh, visible light waves are. In fact, radio waves are so long in wavelength that they can pass through our atmosphere virtually unimpeded. They're so much bigger than the particles in, uh, in our atmosphere that they just pass right over those particles as though they aren't even there and then the radio waves make it all the way to our radio detectors on the ground. So owing to this ability of radio waves to easily pass through the atmosphere, they have a long history of use in the military dating back to World War II when radio waves were used to detect incoming enemy ships and aircraft and a technique known as radar. But radar had one unfortunate weakness, which is that it's possible for the enemy to scramble or jam the incoming radio waves that are searching for them. And you can see that in this wartime illustration. So if these, uh, there's the mouse, if these warplanes are transmitting radio waves in a certain pattern, then those radio waves are going to interfere 
with the waves that are coming from the radar transmitters that are on the ground. And that will prevent anti-aircraft guns from being able to accurately pinpoint where the warplanes are coming from. So in 1942, after a series of incidents in which German warships used radar jamming to make it through the English Channel undetected, a British radar operator named Stanley Hay was tasked with developing anti-jamming methods. And what Hay did was he studied the jamming patterns carefully, and on two days in February of 1942, he received reports of a particularly severe jamming signal. And the signal had the curious behavior of seeming to follow the motion of the sun as the sun moved westward across the sky throughout the day. Now, that could have just been a coincidence, but Hay decided to investigate whether anything interesting was going on with the sun on those days. So Hay contacted the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, where astronomers observe the surface of the sun every day. And here is what Stanley Hay learned. The Royal Observatory reported that on the days in question, an unusually large sunspot, uh, sorry, a large spot was seen on the surface of the sun. We call those sunspots. And in this slide, you see a photograph of sunspots taken from Killarney Park Observatory. So Stanley Hay had made the connection that sunspots emit radio waves, which we receive here on Earth. Three years after Hay's discovery in 1946, a group of Australian radar operators reinforced Hay's findings using a new technique which enabled them to produce an actual image of the sun in radio light. And they were able to show that wherever we see sunspots in visible light, we see intense radio emission at the same locations as the sunspots. So on the slide, these are recent photos of the sun taken at the same time. We have visible light on the left, radio on the right, showing the clear connection between sunspots and radio emission. Hayes' discovery was essentially the beginnings of radio astronomy. This was the first time that radio waves had been connected with an object beyond Earth. But the discovery is also important in the context of understanding the aurora, because we need to learn everything that we can about the light from these eruptions, both visible light and the invisible light, so that we can better understand how these eruptions affect us here on Earth. And you'll see more of that as we go along. Now, one quick and, and somewhat mind-blowing thing about these sunspots, before we move on to a different part of the story, is that when you look at photographs like this of sunspots, it's hard to get a sense of how big they actually are because they seem kind of small relative to the surface of uh, the sun. But we have to remember that the sun is ginormous. Its, uh, its surface area is over 10,000 times bigger than the Earth's. So something that looks small relative to the sun can still be quite large relative to the planet Earth. And to give you a sense of that, Here's a zoomed in photograph of sunspots taken by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's a space telescope in orbit around Earth. And uh, the Earth has been added to the image for comparison, drawn to its actual scale. And you can see that some of these sunspots are the size of our entire planet, right? These, they are the size of worlds, basically. Okay. Uh, let's move on to an earlier and much larger piece of the Aurora puzzle to a discovery made in 1908 by an American astronomer named George Ellery Hale. Hale was able to show by looking really closely at the behavior of visible light around sunspots, that sunspots are magnetic, meaning that if we had an enormous horseshoe magnet and we held it to a pair of sunspots, the magnet would stick to the sunspots. And that discovery told us that the sun has a magnetic field. It is in itself a giant magnet. And what we've learned about the sun over the years is that its magnetic field has a cycle to it. And that cycle is what led to our understanding of the aurora. Okay, so let's talk a bit about magnets for just a moment. Way back in elementary school or high school, you might recall seeing an experiment in which tiny bits of iron are poured all over a bar magnet and instantly the iron bits will redistribute themselves into a pattern that reveals the, uh, the magnet's magnetic field. So we see these curved lines, they begin at end and, and end at each end of the pole, uh, of the poles, and that at the poles, the iron bits are most concentrated because that's where the magnetic field is the strongest. 
if we were to go out into space and dump an enormous pile of iron bits all over our planet, the same thing would happen. The iron bits would trace out magnetic fields very similar to the field of a bar magnet. We'd have the magnetic field lines again going in and out of the Earth's north and south poles where the field is uh, the strongest. And why is that? Where does the Earth's magnetic field come from? It is generated by Earth's spinning liquid iron core. That core is essentially a giant bar magnet, and the field around that magnet extends well beyond our atmosphere. Okay, so what about the sun's magnetic field? What does its field lines look like? Well, given that the Earth's magnetic field is generated by the rotation of its liquid core, then one clue as to the sun's magnetic uh, field must come from its spinning motion as well. And in fact, when we measure the rate at which the sun rotates around its own axis, we find a big clue to its magnetic field, which is this. If we monitor the sun from hour to hour, we're going to see that its sunspots move, as you see on the slide, simply because they're moving with the sun's rotation. So by tracking the sunspots and measuring how long they each take to traverse the sun's surface, we can get at the sun's rotation speed. When we make that measurement, we find something really interesting, that depending on the latitude of the sunspot, so how far they are from the sun's equator, the rotation period changes. The, the, the closer the sunspots are to the equator, the faster the sun's rotation period. So you can see that here, that in the line right above the equator, if there were sunspots there, they only take 25 days to get all the way around the sun, whereas up near the poles, they could take as much as 35 days to get all the way around. So what this is telling us is that the sun is composed of gaseous layers that spin at different speeds. And this is known as differential rotation. This is unlike our planet Earth. Earth is mostly solid. That gives it a much simpler rotation. So the Earth spins at basically the same speed everywhere. Okay, so you can imagine if you start with a spinning bar magnet and then you slice it into layers with each piece spinning at a different speed, then those magnetic field lines are gonna get messy. The lines at the equator are gonna move faster than the lines at higher latitudes. That's gonna cause the lines to skew. And eventually the lines at the equator are gonna start outlapping the lines at higher latitudes. Over time, that's gonna cause the lines to get all twisted up. They're gonna push and pull on each other with such ferocity that some of those magnetic field lines are gonna get pushed right out of the sun's surface. And they're gonna make these loops that go in and out of the sun. And you can see that in this computer generated illustration. So when that happens, energy gets released from the regions around the holes in the form of radio waves, as well as higher energy light, like X-rays and UV light. Oops, one sec. Okay, so these days we can actually see that happening. Even though X-rays and ultraviolet light from space can't penetrate our atmosphere, we've got telescopes into space which, which can see at those high energy wavelengths. And here's an example. This is an ultraviolet photo of the sun taken from space by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. And you can actually see how the ultraviolet light traces out those magnetic loops poking in and out of the sun owing to charged particles from the sun's surface being dragged through those loops causing them to radiate. So it was that behavior of light in around the sunspots that Hale had detected in visible light, leading him to make the connection between sunspots and magnetism. So at these high energy wavelengths, as well as in the radio, at the entry and exit points of the loops, we see these bursts of intense light, we call those solar flares. Whereas when we look at the sun in uh, close up invisible light, we see that those high energy bursts of light coincide with the dark sunspots. And uh, as you can see on the slide, and the reason why those spots appear dark is because those strong magnetic, uh, them strong magnetic fields in those regions, they tend to disrupt the flow of heat. And so you can see like the, the convection of heat going on below the surface of the sun and those field lines are getting in the way. So, that causes the, the regions of the sunspots to cool down and not glow as brightly as uh, the rest of the sun, just like when a stove element cools down and it, and it um, goes, loses its orange glow and it turns black. 
Uh, but when I say cool down, that's in a very, very relative sense, because in these regions around sunspots, we're still talking about temperatures of like 4,000 degrees Celsius, uh, which I guess is cool compared to the rest of the sun, which is closer to 6,000 degrees Celsius. But still, uh, sunspots are, you know, too hot to touch, obviously. These days, solar physicists can produce computer simulations of the sun's magnetic field. You can see one on the slide. And what we see from these simulations is that the sun's differential rotation creates this crazy, distorted mess of magnetic chaos. But underlying that chaos, the cause of it, is a very orderly process in the sense that the rotation speed of each of the sun's layers, they might vary with latitude, but they don't change with time. Each layer rotates at a constant speed. And so that means that there must be a pattern to the chaos. There has to be a cycle in which after a certain number of years, the magnetic field lines get all wound up and then they unwind before getting all twisted up again. A simple way to look for that cycle is to track the sunspots. Because if sunspots are caused by the sun's magnetic field getting all wound up, then if the winding follows a cycle, then we can expect that the number of sunspots is going to follow a cycle as well. When the sun is most wound up, we can expect to see more spots and vice versa. So that's exactly what was found by a German amateur astronomer named Heinrich Schwab. Schwab counted the number of sunspots seen over a period of around two decades from the 1820s to the 1840s and found that the frequency of sunspots follows an 11-year cycle. You can see that in this more recent graph of the sunspot number SSN, that's what's on the vertical axis, seen over a 250 year period. Every 11 years or so, we experience a one to two year period in which at any given time, we see significantly more sunspots than normal. And so when we look at visible light photographs of the sun during one of its 11 year uh, peaks, what we call a solar maximum, like on the right, we see an active sun, lots of sunspots, whereas during an 11-year minimum on the left, we see a quiet sun. Typically some sunspots, but not nearly as many, and they're usually not as large. And of course, since the sunspots coincide with solar flares, when we compare images of the sun at solar maximum to solar minimum in other wavelengths of light as well, radio like we've seen, ultraviolet like you see on the slide, we see numerous intense flares during a solar maximum on the right, and only a few little sparks here and there during a minimum on the left. Okay, so we've now seen that um, the sun can get quite stormy with its sunspots and flares. So let's now see how this activity affects us here on Earth. Scientists on Earth who continually monitor the Earth's magnetic field have observed that every once in a while, the Earth's magnetic field seems to get scrambled. And you can see a graph of this. So normally, the strength of the Earth's magnetic field is pretty steady, but then sometimes it kind of gets all out of control, right? If you happen to be looking at a magnetic compass at that same time, you would see that the compass needle would suddenly go crazy, no longer able to find the Earth's North Pole until the Earth's magnetic field uh, settles back down to normal. Those fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field, they're always going on, but they're typically pretty small, so small that your compass doesn't detect them. But sometimes we'll go through periods where the fluctuations are more frequent and they're more noticeable. In the 1850s, it was found in the records of these, these uh, magnetic storms over the decades that there is a cycle to their behavior. And not just any cycle, but a roughly 11-year cycle. And... Uh, an 11 year cycle that pretty closely coincides with the 11 year sunspot cycle. So you can see that on the graph, the blue bars are the number of geomagnetic storms and uh, the red lines are the number of sunspots. And you can see there's a pretty good correlation that wherever you see a peak in the blue bars, you see a peak in the, in the red lines as well. That connection between the Earth's magnetic storms and sunspots made it clear that the sun's stormy periods are affecting us here on Earth, 150 million kilometers away. So something is coming out of those solar flares besides light to be able to distort the Earth's magnetic field. 
And so by combining what was learned about the sun's magnetic field and the emissions from the sunspots, the underlying physical process emerged, which goes like this. That when the sun's magnetic field lines poke out of the sun, the sun releases solar flares in addition to charged particles, electrons and protons. In fact, the sun is always ejecting charged particles. We know that because they were detected by a, a Soviet spacecraft in 1959. And we call that the solar wind. But when they come from sunspots, they are ejected in particularly intense bursts that we call coronal mass ejections or CMEs. So those bursts of charged particles or plasmas, they shoot off in all directions, but some of them, uh, some of those bursts head toward the earth. And what we know about charged particles is that they are essentially tiny bar magnets simply because they are spinning charged particles. So they're, they're, they're spinning electric fields. And when electric fields spin, they generate magnetic fields. So when a plasma hits the earth, it's just like dumping a bunch of iron bits on our planet. The charged particles get caught in the Earth's magnetic field lines. They get pulled down toward the Earth's poles because that's where the Earth's magnetic field is strongest. And at the same time, the magnetic fields of those charged particles, they cause the Earth's magnetic field to distort. And that's what causes those geomagnetic fluctuations that we measure here on the Earth. So finally, we can put all the pieces together and see what that has to do with aurora. As the charged particles from the sun are pulled into our atmosphere, particularly at the poles, they collide with the atoms in our atmosphere, atoms like oxygen and nitrogen. And as a result of those collisions, the atoms get excited. They gain energy from the charged particles. But then over time, the atoms run out of steam. They calm down back to their, their normal state by giving up the energy that they gained. And that energy is emitted in the form of light waves. So that's the light that produces an aurora. As for the different colors of an aurora, it's because different atoms emit light at different colors when the atoms de-excite. And you might have seen this done, or maybe you've done it yourself in a science lab where you're given a sample of sodium or calcium powder, and you put it in the flame of a Bunsen burner to heat it up that excites it excites the atoms, and you observe that as the atoms de-excite, that the different substances turn the flame different colors. Similarly, when charged particles from the sun excite the different types of atoms in our atmosphere, those atoms will also emit different colors when they de-excite. So for example, the nitrogen gas in our atmosphere, it will produce some reds, some blues, the oxygen gas will produce green colors, or at a higher altitudes where oxygen is less dense, it will actually produce a reddish glow. And so when you've got all this going on at the same time and there's some mixing, you can end up with the amazing variations of color that we see in the aurora. One thing to note though, is that people who have seen aurora will most commonly report that they appear whitish. And this is just because our night vision isn't as good at discerning individual colors as the detector in a camera. So all those really colorful photos that we see, the, the photos do in fact match the colors that are being produced in the atmosphere, but the human eye just tends to perceive those colors less vibrantly. Uh, I've been told though that what the photos or even the videos can't capture from the in-person experience is the, the sort of eeriness or the surreal quality of being surrounded by all that like fluid luminescence. So since aurora are caused by solar activity. They have the same 11 year cycle as the sunspots and the geomagnetic storms. Every 11 years during a solar maximum, when the earth is bombarded by solar storms, we see lots of aurora and they appear more intense and colorful. Uh, at, we also see them at latitudes further from the poles closer to the equator. Whereas during a solar minimum, aurora are less frequent, less intense, and pretty much confined to the earth's poles. So to summarize, in order for eruptions on the sun to create an aurora, a planet needs a global magnetic field and an atmosphere. And as you might expect, Earth isn't the only planet in the solar system with those conditions. The planet Jupiter has those features as well. In fact, it has a magnetic field that's 20,000 times stronger than the Earth's. Uh, it has an atmosphere that's five to 10 times denser than Earth's. 
So not surprisingly, when we observe Jupiter from space, we see Aurora lighting up its poles. And for similar reasons, the planet Saturn exhibits the Aurora light as well. Uh, I'm going to now bring us back to the historical records of Aurora so that we can apply the science to these early records. But before we go all the way back to the ancient records, I just wanted to mention one particularly notable auroral event because it explains why the study of ancient Aurora continues to be important. Sometimes eruptions from the sun can be particularly intense. And when they reach the earth, our atmosphere can get so charged up that it can affect our ability to communicate. Uh, this is even more of an issue today with our reliance on, on satellite communication. But even prior to wireless communication, there are records of strong geomagnetic storms that affected power and communication lines. And a particularly famous incident happened in September 1859. So this has been named the Carrington event after a British, a British astronomer who reported a very bright solar flare on September 1, 1859. And to date, this is the strongest geomagnetic storm in recorded history. The eruption was so strong that aurora were seen as far south as Hawaii, Mexico, Colombia, so places where no human had ever seen an aurora. So it must have been quite startling. And there are numerous uh, newspaper reports from all over the world with really dramatic descriptions of aurora sightings on that date. So like this one on the slide, the aurora were so brilliant that they gave rise to the rumor of a large fire. There were other reports that mentioned intense colors, and there were reports that animals were affected, that apparently roosters started to crow, thinking that it was morning. Meanwhile, telegraph operators were finding that they couldn't transmit clear signals. So for those of you who remember the telegraph, this was the way that humans communicated over long distances in the 1850s. And a telegraph operator would tap out a message in Morse code and that the code would be converted into electrical signals that were sent along cables that connected telegraph operators across continents. But during this geomagnetic storm in 1859, the charged up atmosphere was inducing power surges that were messing up the timing of the electrical signals. And so they couldn't be decoded properly until a telegraph operator in Boston, who was attempting to send a message to an operator in Portland, made the real realization that if you disconnect the battery, that the atmosphere alone would transmit the signal and do it more clearly. And so the newspapers later reported their exchange, which went like this, uh, Boston to Portland, please cut off your battery entirely from the line for 15 minutes. Portland responds, we'll do so. It is now disconnected. Boston says, mine is disconnected and we are working with the auroral current. How do you receive my writing? Portland responds, better than with our batteries on. Boston goes on to explain why the aurora was messing with, uh, with the batteries and ends with, suppose we work without batteries while we are affected by this trouble. And Portland responds very well. Shall we go ahead with business? So um, at this point in the early history of our reliance on telecommunication, it was possible to easily pivot in this situation. But if a Carrington event were to happen today, it could get a lot messier. We would likely experience major disruptions of power grids and satellite communications, including GPS systems, which so much of our transportation systems and infrastructure now depend on. So there's a lot of interest in learning as much as we can about these extreme solar storms to maybe discover a pattern or some, sign of, uh, some sort of early warning sign. And since they don't seem to happen very often, we have to look for them in the past as far back as we can. And that's why it becomes important to determine whether these 3000 year old ancient records do in fact refer to an Aurora, especially records like this one of glowing lights in unexpected places, because those are most likely to be caused by one of these extreme geomagnetic storms. So to see how we can sleuth out whether an ancient record refers to an aurora or not, we're gonna go even further back in time than recorded human history to possibly the strongest known solar eruption to date, which occurred over 14,000 years ago. Now, how on earth could we possibly know that? Here's the evidence. The resulting carbon-14 record exhibits an abrupt spike occurring in a single year at 14,000 calendar years 
before present. The correspondence with beryllium-10 anomalies allows us to propose the event as a solar energetic particle event. Okay, translation, solar eruptions leave behind little coded messages on Earth in some very, very interesting places. So here's where we're going to get into the really, really good stuff. Okay, this is, um, if you have coffee or Coke, this is a good time to uh, recharge. Okay. While we, um, while we sit here in this quiet, seemingly peaceful space, we might not be getting rained on, but our planet is being bombarded by high energy particles from outer space. We call those, those cosmic rays. They come from all sorts of high energy things happening in the universe, like supernova, galaxy collisions, or they can come from solar eruptions. In high enough amounts, cosmic rays are dangerous for humans. They are high energy radiation capable of damaging human cells, but the Earth's awesome magnetic field deflects most cosmic rays, and those that make it through will interact with particles in our atmosphere, and that causes them to weaken in intensity and kind of fizzle out as they uh, get lower in our atmosphere. So cosmic rays don't really have much effect on humans unless you fly a lot. I mean, even if you do, your elevated dose of cosmic rays is so low that there doesn't seem to be a definitive connection between frequency of uh, air flight and cancer. Okay, so that's just one less thing to, to worry about. Anyway, when cosmic rays interact with molecules in our atmosphere, chemical reactions take place in which the products can be radioactive. So you can see an example on the slide. This is the production of the cosmogenic radioactive isotope carbon-14. Cosmogenic simply means produced from cosmic rays. And uh, radioactive atoms can come in very handy because they enable us to do something called radiometric dating, or in the case of carbon-14, it's more commonly known as carbon dating. To see how that works, let's first address what radioactive actually means. A radioactive atom is simply an atom with an unstable core. And the core of an atom, its nucleus, that's where most of its matter resides in the form of protons and neutrons. So that's where the, the mass of matter primarily comes from. Between those particles, there's all sorts of little forces that cause the particles to push and pull on each other. As long as the protons and the neutrons are arranged in a nice uniform way, the forces will all balance out and the nucleus will stay stuck together forever. But there are some forms of atoms where the distribution of protons and neutrons is not nice and uniform. And a particularly important example is a form of carbon called carbon-14. Carbon-14 is an unstable form of carbon because it's got two more neutrons than it should. And those two little neutrons, they create a very slight instability such that owing to the, the dark magic that is nuclear physics, one of the neutrons somehow converts itself into a proton, shooting out an electron in the process. And that causes the carbon nucleus to actually morph into a different atom. It, it becomes nitrogen. So because carbon-14 has this behavior of decaying, of shooting out particles, we say that it is radioactive. Now, why is that useful? It's because... Every radioactive atom has an exponential rate at which it decays, and those rates can be measured. In the case of carbon-14, the decay rate is such that whenever carbon-14 is created in the atmosphere by cosmic rays, it begins to decay. And 5,700 years later, the number of carbon-14 atoms will have been reduced by 50%. So we call 5,700 years the half-life of the carbon-14 atom. So if we find a sample of carbon-14 in some, some uh, substance on Earth, we measure that its population has been reduced by 50%, then we've just learned that that substance formed 5,700 years ago. And no matter what population drop we measure, we can just plug it into this known decay rate for carbon-14 and determine the number of years that have elapsed. So radioactive elements like carbon-14 provide us with this very important gauge of measuring the age of substances over time spans longer than human history. Okay, so back to the cosmic rays. When cosmic rays interact with our atmosphere, they produce two types of useful radioactive atoms, carbon-14 and beryllium-10. 
Like carbon-14, beryllium-10 has two extra neutrons, causing similar instabilities in its nucleus. But its half-life is, is nearly one and a half million years. So it's still unstable, but it's far less so than carbon-14 is. Okay, so what happens to these cosmogenic radioactive atoms? Well, the carbon-14 atoms eventually attach themselves to oxygen, and they form carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gets absorbed by living things on Earth, like trees and animals and humans, making all living things on Earth slightly radioactive, though it's, it's really not anything we need to worry about. It just, it just is what it is. Uh, and meanwhile, beryllium-10 has a very different fate. It quickly gets swept up into precipitation, and it's delivered to, to Earth inside either raindrops or snowflakes. So that's how evidence of solar activity can get transported to the Earth and stored in places like trees and ice. But in order to actually learn anything from those atoms, there's still some decoding that we have to do. So let's first see how this is done with trees. You've very likely seen samples of tree trunks in which you can see that there's visible rings. You're likely aware that the rings can be used to deduce the tree's age simply because each year, a tree grows a little bit thicker. And because that growth varies in appearance, depending on the season, you, you get these um, annual rings that are clearly delineated. And that they enable a uh, dendrochronologist to measure the tree's lifespan just by counting its rings. Now, we just saw that cosmogenic carbon-14 is absorbed by trees as they grow. And we saw that we can use carbon-14 as a gauge of age. So a dendrochronologist can therefore measure carbon-14 abundance in each ring and use that to anchor each ring to a specific calendar year. So you see that done in this, um, in this sample. Okay, so last year, a group of researchers did that analysis on a very special group of trees. These are trees near a riverbank in the Southern French Alps. They've been buried by sediment at the end of the last ice age, about 20,000 years ago. So they were deprived of oxygen and therefore preserved in time, even though their carbon-14 kept ticking away, keeping keep, uh, track of the years. The trees were eventually discovered after years of erosion, and the carbon-14 analysis revealed that they are over 14,000 years old. What this analysis also revealed is a sharp spike of carbon-14 in the year 14,300 plus or minus one BP, which means before present, and um, where present is standardized as the year 1950. The magnitude of that spike corresponds to a 30% increase in carbon-14. And that would make this not only 10 times stronger than the Carrington event, but also the strongest known solar eruption to reach the Earth. You can also see there's um, another broader increase right around here. That increase is caused by something else far less exciting. And uh, we don't have time to discuss it now, but uh, during the Q&A, if anyone cares, I'm happy to explain what is causing that. Back to the more exciting spike. So how definitive is, is this? Does this spike really represent a surge of cosmic rays from the sun? Or was it caused by some other source of carbon-14 that has nothing to do with solar activity? How can we corroborate this uh, with entirely independent evidence? Well, what we can do is we can look at another cosmogenic probe of cosmic rays, which is beryllium-10. As we saw, beryllium-10 is brought to the Earth in precipitation. And in the really cold places on Earth where precipitation freezes and it collects from year to year, we can get our hands on ancient ice. And if we can somehow connect the ice to specific calendar years, we should find that in roughly the same years that we see spikes in carbon-14, we should also see spikes in beryllium-10, if the carbon-14 spikes do indeed correspond to cosmic rays. Okay, so let's see what the ice tells us. Every winter in the really cold places on our planet, so places like Antarctica and Greenland, it snows. Most of that snow melts away in the summer, but in those really cold places, the summer season is typically so mild and short that not all of the snow melts. And so you get these layers of leftover ice that pile up on top of each other. 
And each of those annual layers contains information about the state of our atmosphere at the time that the snow melted. So scientists have drilled deep into those ice deposits and they've pulled out cores of ice that are nearly three kilometers in length. And from those cores, they can reproduce the atmospheric con uh, conditions of our planet out to nearly a million years ago. So the study of those ice cores is known as paleoclimatology. The way that data is extracted from ice cores is extremely cool. Just like with the tree rings, the number of layers can tell us roughly the time span of a particular ice layer. But if we want to con uh, connect a layer to a specific calendar year, then we need, like the tree rings, we need some way to anchor the layers to real time. Amazingly, the cores themselves contain that information. And you'll have seen this for yourself if you've ever hiked inside of an ice cave. So see those black layers in the, in the ice? Those are ice layers that form during a year when a volcanic eruption occurred. And uh, a volcanic eruption that spewed ash clouds into the atmosphere, which traveled and fell back to the earth in precipitation. And since we know the specific years of the Earth's major volcanic eruptions just by dating volcanic rock, those black lines are like a chronological ruler that are embedded inside the ice core. So here's a photograph of a segment of one of those cores. You can see a particularly strong ash layer. And uh, from that, a calendar year can be deduced following the sequence of ash layers along the full length of the core that this segment was cut from. And then once each volcanic layer has been assigned to a calendar year, then you can interpolate, right? You can assign specific years to the other layers in between the volcanic layers, typically within a precision of plus or uh, minus 10 years. So the resolution of this method, it's not as high as you can get from tree rings, but it's still high enough to capture any really dramatic events in the atmosphere that might have occurred in a particular decade. And we've learned so much from these ice, ice cores. Uh, if I can just make a very quick digression, this graph is a really important example. By measuring carbon dioxide levels in air bubbles trapped inside ice cores, we can determine carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere back to hundreds of thousands of years ago. And what that reveals is that there, there is a natural cycle to carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. You can see that on the slide. Uh, and that cycle actually correlates with the ice age cycle. But if you take a look at the onset of industrialization in the mid 1900s on the right side, you see a spike in carbon dioxide never seen before in this uh, over this time span. And that essentially proves that the current increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is our fault. Uh, I don't mean to depress everyone. This is just to demonstrate how incredibly informative these ice cores can be. Okay, so what do the beryllium-10 levels tell us? Well, using an ice core drilled out of Greenland in 2005, paleoclimatologists have constructed the history of beryllium-10 levels out to 60,000 years in the past. And just like with carbon-14, we see a spike in beryllium-10 at roughly the same time and roughly the same magnitude as the carbon-14 spike. But in this case, we're seeing the spike in a region on Earth nearly 4,000 kilometers away from those trees in France, as you would expect for a global cosmogenic surge from the sun. As for ruling out other sources of cosmic rays, that can be done with reasonable confidence using a, a variety of clues. Just as an ex example, cosmic rays that are produced in other parts of our galaxy, they have to travel long distances through our galaxy to get to us, and along the way, they encounter um, magnetic forces other, from other sources, and that tends to spread them out in energy. So when they manifest themselves in ice cores on Earth, they don't appear as, as these sharp peaks. They're kind of more rounded. Okay, so using these kinds of tools and strategies, whenever we find human records of unusual glowing lights in the sky, we can look for evidence of intense solar activity in places like ice cores and tree rings, to establish whether or not the written records were indeed describing an aurora. Uh, now, unfortunately, the one important bit of information that we don't have about these ancient surges is whether or not they occurred during a solar maximum. 
the 11 year cycle, it's just not precise enough that we can count backwards to thousands of years ago. We can use cosmogenic radioisotopes to track the solar cycle, but as you get further and further back in time, the carbon-14 and the beryllium-10 measurements, they get so noisy that the 11-year cycle just gets kind of lost in the noise. And that makes it difficult to pick out anything other than these surges uh, with any reliability. But what we do know from records of more recent surges is that they have occurred during solar minima. It turns out that a quiet sun doesn't mean it's entirely inactive. It can still stir and snore once in a while. For example, in May 1921, a strong geomagnetic storm was reported to have caused all sorts of electrical problems on Earth. Uh, you can see some reports on the slide. And as you can see in the graph at the bottom, the peak of that storm occurred near a solar minimum when the sun had no business waking us all up like that. So the more data that we can get on these really strong ancient flare-ups, perhaps we can discern a cause or even a cycle to the really strong ones and get a better idea if this is something that we really need to worry about. And if so, what should we do to protect ourselves from a potential internet apocalypse? But maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing, right? Maybe it would help us rediscover <laughs> our inner primitive child and all the crazy stuff we did before the internet. <laughs> okay. Hopefully by this point, you are curious as to where we currently are in the 11 year solar cycle. As many of you already know, we are only within a year or two of the next solar peak. You can see that on this graph. So the curved red and gray lines show us the next predicted peak. This just comes from computer modeling of the solar cycle, whereas those black lines come from actual sunspot counts. And what's interesting is that the current sunspot counts are higher than predicted by the model. So that could mean one of two things. Either the prediction is off by a year, and the next peak is actually, um, you know, it's more upon us. It could occur in 2024 rather than 2025. That's totally reasonable. Just like the weather, the solar cycle isn't such an exact science that we can predict it with perfect accuracy. The other possibility, though, is that the timing of the prediction is correct, but the intensity is underestimated, meaning that the peak really will occur in 2025, but that we're going to see more sunspots, more intense geomagnetic storms, and more intense aurora than predicted. We can actually predict the likelihood of an, of an aurora at an even finer grain level than just an approximate year, could, because we can use the Earth's magnetic field as an aurora alert system. By constantly monitoring fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic field, which is done by organizations like the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, the NOAA, we can identify periods of particularly intense geomagnetic activity because they, those periods can last for several hours. And then we can use that as a forecast of a particularly good night for aurora watching. And just like meteorologists use the UV index as a measurement of the UV light Earth receives on a particular day, scientists who track Earth's geomagnetic activity use what's called the KP index. The P stands for planetary, and the K comes from a German word that essentially means numeric index or digit. So the KP index is a number from zero to nine, where high numbers mean intense geomag uh, geomagnetic activity and therefore high likelihood of intense and uh, low latitude aurora, whereas a low KP index means aurora are less intense and more likely confined to high latitudes. On any date and time, you can go to a site like the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. You can see a visual map of the KP index showing you where on Earth aurora are most likely. So on the left, that is the aurora forecast during a solar minimum. Uh, again, green means a relatively low probability of aurora. And on the right, that's the forecast during a solar maximum. Red means high likelihood of an aurora. And you can see how the auroral region covers a greater area down to lower latitudes. So as we approach the next solar maximum, this is exciting times for those of us who love the beauty of the night sky. Over the last few months, as the sky has been darker for longer periods of time, there have been an increasing number of aurora sightings in southern Ontario. And in fact, this photograph was taken just last fall by our fellow RASC member Shaquille from Luther Lake. 
which is only uh, one and a half hours drive from Toronto. It is a 20 second exposure. So that's 300 times longer than the exposure time of our eye. And that means the camera is picking up more intense and more vibrant light than the eye can see, particularly with the reds and the pinks. So I asked Shaquille uh, to describe what he actually saw with his eye. And he said, visually, there was a light green yellow glow along the horizon, which was continually shifting. On top of this appeared huge white pillars, which slowly appeared and disappeared as they moved from right to left. The movement was very noticeable, especially during the height of the storm, where the lights were in a continual state of flux, a symphony of light rising up from the horizon and dancing across the northern sky. And thank you uh, to Shaquille for providing me with such a perfect way to close things. Uh, so th that's it. I hope you all enjoyed the talk, learned some new stuff, and that it got you excited about what the night sky has in store for us over the next few years as we ride out this upcoming solar maximum together. Thank you. All right. So if you have a question and if you, if you want to come up, that would be great. Uh, if not, call out your question and perhaps Robin could repeat the question for the, for the mic. I'm terrified of this, just so you know. Go ahead, John. You promised it would be easy. Wonderful talk, Robin. Thank you so much. Okay, I love how you tied all of that together. Um, anyway, my question is probably more of a physics question than an astronomy questions. And whenever uh, I kind of understand how magnetism works or whatever, and we see the lines uh, around any magnet, the Earth, the sun, whatever, I'm just wondering why there actually are lines and what's in between the lines. Is there no magnetism, less magnet? And if you feel that that's out of scope for this talk, no. just maybe tell, uh, tell us where we can go and uh, learn about that, where, you know, something in my level can un actually understand it. Okay. Right. That's my question. Okay. Thank you, John. That's a great question. Um, uh, it's not that there's empty space in between those lines. I mean, it's kind of continuous. It's just that when you know when you when you try to represent it in a diagram, you can't draw zillions of lines all over the place. But um, although having said that, <laughs> when I think of those iron uh, those iron bit experiments, you do get spaces, right? Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. And the, and the thing is, is like, are they constant? If you did the exact same experiment uh, on, you know, would you get the exact same empty spaces in the same spots? I, I don't know. That is a really good question. Maybe I'll, you know, if only I had a device where I could ask it any question in, in the universe, maybe we'll try that after and see what, what the internet has to say. But interesting to think about. I was going to ask the short version, but now that I'm mic'd up, I can go on the long. No, one. not the Heath, a long question. Go figure it. So the event that occurred 14,000 years ago, one of the things I like about physicists is how mathematically they can sort of decide whether something can happen or not. So because that event was, you mentioned, 10 times greater than anything else that's ever been recorded, is it possible that was non-solar system related, not sun related, mm -hmm. but something extra galactic, let's say? Right. Okay. So the... um cosmic rays that we get from other sources like uh, uh, supernova, sometimes colliding black holes and that kind of stuff. So they are tend to be stronger actually than the um, the bursts that we get from the sun. But um, what happens is, you know, they're coming from longer distances and they have to travel through either our galaxy or whatever galaxy they came from. And they encounter all these other magnetic poles and pushes as they pass through and that tends to spread out the peak and so that's what makes it discernible from that sharp peak that we get from the sun so we do get really strong you know like gamma ray bursts and stuff like that but um it doesn't have the same profile as uh the solar bursts do but you're measuring something fourteen thousand years ago you mentioned the resolution was plus or minus 10 years so anything something right. that was five years in duration would appear to be a sharp peak at that level of resolution. Right. So plus or minus 10 years in the beryllium, but only plus or minus one year in the carbon. Yeah. And it has a very distinct profile where it shoots up very suddenly within a year and then 
that seems to be what defines those kinds of events. On the uh, KP scale, uh, where would the Carrington event be? Would it be a nine or off the scale and something uh, even higher than that? Yeah, interesting. I guess it, it's a nine only because I don't know, like, is there a, an actual mathematical formula for where the KP comes from? I, I don't know. Maybe someone else knows that. I, I Like, I don't know what defines the different levels, but if nine is the highest, then it would be a nine. Okay. No, because then you won't get mic'd. I'm going to ask one on the way over. <laughs> uh, and that is uh, sunspot cycle. Um, you, you pointed out sunspot cycle, roughly 11 years. But there were have been a number of periods, like the Maunder minimum and right. the Dalton minimum, where uh, they, they were missing almost for extended periods of time. Um, is there any uh, known rationale for those? And is there any correlation? Is there a similar correlation to um, the effects that we see on Earth from sunspots and stuff where they were, uh, it was substantially reduced? Um, so they, uh, it, that they still remain a mystery, those long periods of time where you get practically no sunspots, even during, uh, you know, um, during what are supposed to be solar maximum, they seem to be climate related. That's sort of the latest thing. Um, but uh, yeah, still kind of a mystery as to like whether there's a cycle to them. Um, as far as whether they affect us on Earth, I mean, you do see them in the cores. And that bump that I was saying, that's the boring bit. It's related to a similar minimum, not the exact same date range as the Maunder minimum, but of the same uh, length of time. And it's because they they go in opposite. So when, um, hang on, let me get this right. When you have a lot of cosmic rays from the sun, they um, make it difficult. Sorry, when there's a lot of solar activity going on, it makes it more difficult for the cosmic rays to get to us. And so it causes a dip in the uh, in the signs that you see in trees and ice cores. So instead of the 11 year cycle, like it's an inverse cycle when you normally, when you look at the cosmogenic signs, does that make sense? Okay. okay. One follow up just to delay Randy. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, there were multiple colors in that chart and ah. the, the other one was pink or it was a different color anyway. Right. Pink maybe the ones with the, the chart with the peak. Yeah, that is yes. Shaking? And the, and the one where this, this is another cause that I right. just mentioned. And, and is that because that's the other cause? Um, no, the different colors are because there were three sets of trees that were found and each set came from a different age period. And they had to be, there was a little bit of overlap between each population of trees and they had to be stitched together. So the different colors correspond to the different tree populations. Okay. Thank you. He asked my questions. No, he didn't. Uh, oh, <laughs> by the way, uh, on Sunday, when we're at the national office looking at all the archives, the doctor and Mrs. Maunder were on a 1905 RASC solar eclipse expedition to Labrador, and there was a scrapbook kept, and there are signatures of the Maunders and pictures of the Maunders that you can look at. That's, That's just amazing. a commercial. My question has to do with the shimmering. Any idea what causes the shimmering? Because it's moving back and forth so quickly and it's the shimmering of the northern light of the northern light yeah you're asking someone who's never seen one before oh okay yeah so i i don't know i don't know okay it yeah i'd be very curious because it's very dynamic mm -hmm. yes john okay regarding the uh the solar min max uh cycle um when when a maximum happens only 10 years after the previous one, is the next one going to still be 11 years later or is it more likely to be 12 years later? So it still averages every 11 years. Yeah, great question. I, I don't, I, my understanding is that there isn't a known connection like that, that, or maybe we just don't know the cycle well enough, mm -hmm. but it's anyone's guess whether a short would follow a short, a long would follow a, a long. And forgive me if this uh, was already asked or answered, uh, okay. but um, so we know that there is a solar cycle. Do we know why there's a solar cycle? Like what's the 
you know, physical reason. Right. Um, so the physical reason would be that there's um, like it, what it's, I was talking before about how the layers, they, um, you know, there's different layers in the sun and they're each are spinning at their own cycle, right? Like the innermost layer, the equatorial layer, 25 days, you get higher up to the poles, it's 35 days. And so they all skew over time. Every 11 years they get they're most wound up, but because each of those, it, it's sort of um like numeric, it's a numeric pattern because each of those layers are following their same regular cycle that they're, uh, you're eventually going to get to a point where they're going to reset, like they're going to line up again. And that happens every 11 years. Okay. And do we know if this happens in other stars? Uh, does it depend oh. on like where it is in the cycle of, you know, stars? Is it a uh, you know, similar for the same class. Uh, right. You know? What a great question. It certainly should be, right? Like whenever we find other sun-like stars out there, would they have the same 11-year cycle? So the 11-year cycle has to do with the rotation period of the star. Do all sun-like stars have the same rotation period of, of the sun? I'm sure there's a range. Uh, that's, that's really cool. I'm going to look into that. Okay. Neat question. Any idea for the reason for the differential rotation rates? Um, the, uh, it's like, it's complicated, right? Because it's a fluid and um, what's causing the, okay, I'm just gonna say no. I, I yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, anytime you have these churning up fluids and then they're, they're being heated up by the nuclear fusion that's going on at the core, right? Um, it's, it's part of that. And, you know, like the fact that there's temperature gradients through the sun, but there's also some like gravity issues that are going on. So I, I don't really know exactly, but there's a lot going on in the sun. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> How many layers there are in the sun? Um, yeah, like layers would be an overly simple way of saying it. It's more like continuous. It continuous ranges. Right. But we actually have determined how many zones there are within. Um, is, that, is it all just? I weird? think I think it's pretty continuous yeah. in the sense that like that line that I drew at um, twenty five days. If you were to be slightly above it, it would be a little bit higher than twenty five days. Right. Yeah. Okay. 